1968, Congress ended the requirement that the Federal Reserve hold gold to back the money it created. Afterward, there were no longer any constraints on how much money the Fed could create. During the five and a half decades that have followed, the Fed has created money on an increasingly astronomical scale. The ability of the Fed to create limitless amounts of money fundamentally changed the nature of our economic system. It's the principal reason that capitalism evolved into creditism. This video is the fourth in this series, Creditism 101. It provides a history of money creation by the Fed by comparing the amount of money the Fed created over eight consecutive periods between 1914 and 2023. It also discusses the rationale for some of the Fed's actions. The video focuses narrowly on money creation, everything else necessary to understand the Federal Reserve and how it functions today will be provided in later videos in this series. The Federal Reserve was created by Congress in 1913 and began its operations the following year. It was created primarily to stop banking panics from spiraling into systemic banking crises, which had frequently caused sharp credit contractions and severe recessions in the past, most recently in 1907. To fulfill this function, the Fed was given the power to create and extend credit to banks, thereby providing liquidity to the banking sector in times when panic threatened to prevent even sound banks and businesses from obtaining funding. The Fed creates credit, Federal Reserve credit, either through discounting operations or through open market operations. In discounting operations, the Fed creates credit and lends it to a bank in exchange for collateral. In open market operations, the Fed creates credit and uses it to buy bonds. Today, either government bonds or bonds issued or guaranteed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. When the Fed makes a loan to a bank in exchange for collateral, that collateral is recorded as an asset on the Fed's balance sheet. In exchange for that collateral, the Fed makes a deposit into that bank's reserve account at the Fed, adding to that bank's reserve balances. That causes an expansion of bank reserves on the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet. Likewise, when the Fed buys a government bond from a bank, that bond is recorded as an asset on the Fed's balance sheet. To pay for the bond it acquires, the Fed makes a deposit into the reserve account of the bank from which it buys the bond, adding to that bank's reserve balances and thereby to the level of bank reserves throughout the banking system. Bank reserves are assets for the commercial banks, but liabilities for the Fed. Therefore, the more bonds the Fed buys, the larger its liabilities in the form of bank reserves become. In both cases, lending operations and open market operations, the money that the Fed deposits is not money that previously existed. The act of making the deposits creates the money, or more precisely, it creates bank reserves, which, along with currency and circulation, make up the money supply. So it's correct to speak of the Fed creating money or creating credit, because the credit that the Fed creates, bank reserves, is money. The definition of base money is bank reserves plus currency in circulation. Congress placed constraints on how much money, how much Federal Reserve credit, the Fed could create, however. The Fed was required to hold gold to back the money it created it was required to maintain 35% gold backing for the reserves in the commercial bank's reserve accounts at the Fed, in other words, for bank reserves, and it was required to hold 40% gold backing for the Federal Reserve notes in circulation, in other words, the currency, 
The purpose of these constraints was to check the power of the Fed and to limit how much money it could create. As we'll see, those constraints only remained in place until 1968. The Fed's gold cover ratio measured the Fed's gold assets as a percentage of its currency and deposit liabilities, in other words, relative to Federal Reserve notes and bank reserves outstanding. This ratio was published each week. The Fed began its operations in November 20, 1914 with a gold cover ratio of 105% meaning the Fed had more than enough gold to back all the bank reserves and Federal Reserve notes existing at that time. Then something unexpected happened, World War I. World War I began in 1914, but the United States didn't enter the war until 1917. When it did, the Fed's responsibilities changed. Its principal responsibility became to ensure that the U.S. government could borrow as much money as it required to fight and win the war. To fulfill this role, the Fed began creating Federal Reserve credit on a much larger scale than had been anticipated when it was created by Congress a few years earlier. From 1915 to 1920, the Fed created $3.3 billion of Federal Reserve credit, primarily through lending to banks. The collateral it received in exchange for this credit was recorded in the Fed's balance sheet as an asset. In exchange for the collateral it received, the Fed made deposits into the bank's reserve accounts at the Fed, causing bank reserves to expand. As a result of World War I, Federal Reserve credit jumped from $10 million in 1914 to $3.4 billion in 1920. As the Fed extended Federal Reserve credit by creating bank reserves, its gold cover ratio declined from 105% in 1914 to 45% in 1920, a level not far above its statutory minimum of somewhere between 35 and 40%. Okay, now 1920 to 1930, after the war. When the war ended, Much of the credit the Fed had created during the war was repaid in 1921. Afterward, there were only relatively small fluctuations in Federal Reserve credit during the rest of the decade. During this decade, the Fed once again functioned as it was originally designed to. Federal Reserve credit outstanding contracted very sharply from $3.4 billion in 1920 to 1.6 billion in 1921 and into the decade at 1.4 billion. The contraction of Federal Reserve credit during 1921 resulted in a big improvement in the Fed's gold cover ratio, which rose from 45% in 1920 to 80% in 1922. It ended 1930 at 76%. Now, 1930 to 1941, the Great Depression. When the economic bubble that had formed in the 1920s popped in 1929, banks began to fail in very large numbers. The Fed extended some Federal Reserve credit in 1931, 1932, and 1933, but not enough or soon enough to prevent a systemic banking sector collapse. Had the Fed acted sooner and lent much more, it could have prevented the banking collapse and therefore the Great Depression. Federal Reserve credit increased from $1.3 billion in 1930 to a peak of $2.7 billion in 1933 and into the decade at $2.4 billion. An enormous amount of gold entered the U.S. after 1933 as money fled the Nazis in Europe and the Japanese in Asia. Much of that money ended up as assets on the Fed's balance sheet, as shown here. The Fed's gold holdings surged. 
As a result of the gold inflows, the Fed's gold cover ratio rose from 76% at the end of 1930 to 91% at the end of 1941. Despite the increase in Federal Reserve credit from 1931 to 1933, now, 1941 to 1945, World War II. During World War II, to help finance the war, the Fed created money by extending Federal Reserve credit on a much larger scale than it had even during World War I. The largest increase in Federal Reserve credit during the war was $7.5 billion in 1943 versus a peak of just 1.4 billion in 1918. Federal Reserve credit outstanding surged by more than 10 times in just four years, from $2.4 billion in 1941 to $25 billion in 1945. The rapid growth in Federal Reserve credit drove down the Fed's gold cover ratio from 91% in 1941 to just 42% in 1945. 42% was dangerously close to the minimum level required by law, raising the possibility that the Fed would not be able to continue creating more money. To avoid that outcome, Congress lowered the level of gold the Fed was required to hold to 25% of its bank reserves and currency liabilities. This change significantly increased the amount of money the Fed could create. Now, 1945 to 1971, the Bretton Woods era. From the end of World War II until 1960, Federal Reserve credit increased in some years and contracted in other years. During the 1960s, however, Federal Reserve credit never contracted. It only grew at a very rapid pace for reasons that will be explained in the next video. The amount of Federal Reserve credit extended in 1971 topped the peak amount extended during World War II. In 1971, the Fed created $8.6 billion. At the peak of World War II, just $7.5 billion. From 1945 to 1960, Federal Reserve credit outstanding only grew from $25 billion to $29 billion. But by 1971, it had exploded to $77 billion. During these Bretton Woods years, the Fed's gold holdings peaked at $23 billion in 1949, but then plunged to less than $10 billion by 1971 due to the United States' unfavorable balance of payments. During this period, the Fed's gold cover ratio peaked at 57% in 1950, but fell rapidly after that due to the reduction in the Fed's gold holdings and then to the surge in Fed credit creation. By 1965, the ratio had fallen to 28%. At that point, Congress changed the law again by removing the requirement that the Fed hold gold to back bank reserves. That change boosted the ratio back up to 41%, but still the Fed was creating so much money by this time that the reprieve didn't last long. Finally, with the gold cover ratio down to 26% in March 1968, Congress ended the requirement that the Fed back dollars with gold. From then on, the Fed was free to create as much money by extending Federal Reserve credit as it pleased. Three years later, President Nixon reneged on the United States commitment to allow other countries to convert the dollars they held into U.S. gold. And that was the end of gold-backed money, not only in the U.S., but, as we'll see later, all around the world. This series will show that from that point on, many of the most important constraints that had regulated economic relations up until then ceased to exist, and that capitalism began to evolve into something different.
creditism. Now, 1971 to 2007, after gold. The Fed created $9 billion in 1971, more than it did at the peak of World War II, but that was just the beginning. In 1986, it created $31 billion. In 1993, $41 billion. In 2002, $69 billion. And this skips over the $133 billion the Fed created in 1999 related to its misplaced fears over Y2K. Between 1971 and 2007, Federal Reserve credit outstanding surged by $823 billion, from $77 billion to $900 billion. Of course, this expansion of Federal Reserve credit would have been impossible if the Fed had still been required to back dollars with gold. There was simply not enough gold to allow the expansion of so much credit. 2007 to 2014, the crisis of 2008. In response to the crisis of 2008, the Fed created money on a previously unimaginable scale. When the Roaring Twenties economic bubble began to pop in 1930, the Fed failed to create enough money fast enough to prevent the systemic banking crisis that resulted in the Great Depression. The Fed wouldn't make the same mistake again. When banks started to fail this time, the Fed created $1.3 trillion in 2008, 10 times more than the previous Y2K high. In 2010, the Fed created $192 billion. In 2011, $493 billion. In 2013, another $1.1 trillion. And then for good measure, $475 billion more in 2014. Between 2007 and 2014, Federal Reserve credit outstanding leapt from $900 billion to $4.5 trillion, a five-fold increase over seven years. The result? The economy was reflated, the banks returned to solvency, and there was no new Great Depression. Now, 1914 to 2023, COVID. Only a few years later, the COVID pandemic struck. Again, the economy faced the possibility of a new systemic banking sector meltdown leading to a new Great Depression. The Fed extended $3.2 trillion in Federal Reserve credit in 2020. That was two and a half times the previous peak set in 2008. And then another $1.4 trillion in 2021. Calamity was once again averted. Between 1914 and 2023, Federal Reserve credit outstanding jumped from $4.5 trillion to $7.7 trillion. All of the increase occurred between March 2020 and April 2022. During those two years, Federal Reserve credit doubled, peaking at just under $9 trillion. In 1971, the year the collapse of the Bretton Woods International Monetary System put an end to gold-backed money, the Fed created $9 billion. In 2020, the Fed created $3.2 trillion, 356 times more than in 1971. The Fed's ability to create money on this scale makes it the world's most powerful economic institution. The next video will show how the Fed has used its power to help finance surging government debt. Before concluding this video, however, allow me to point out that the Fed is not alone in creating money on an enormous scale. When the United States stopped backing dollars with gold following the breakdown of the Bretton Woods International Monetary System in 1971, all the other countries of the world stopped backing their currencies with gold too. Since the turn of the century, all the major central banks have created the equivalent of trillions of dollars.
The Fed's total assets have increased by 970 percent since 2002. But the Fed is not alone. The total assets of the People's Bank of China have increased by 900 percent, the Euro systems by 800 percent, and the Bank of Japan's by 400 percent. Now the Fed's total assets amount to $7.8 trillion. The ECB's amount to the equivalent of $7.6 trillion. The People's Bank of China, the equivalent of $6.3 trillion. And the Bank of Japan's the equivalent of $5.2 trillion. This shows that creditism is a global phenomenon.